Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. I'm your host, Ken Wise, and we are right in the middle of the 180th anniversary of the Texas Revolution. In fact, today is March 2nd, 2016, which is Texas Independence Day, so happy Independence Day. 180 years ago today, the Texas Convention at Washington on the Brazos drafted a Declaration of Independence from Mexico. Not surprisingly, it looked familiar and a lot like the U.S. Declaration of Independence. So go online and read the Texas Declaration of Independence and remember the spirit of the founders of this great state. Now, last episode, we talked about the events leading up to the Siege of the Alamo. That episode ended with the Texians at Bay Harsh spotting Santa Ana's advance guard approaching the town. 180 years ago today, on March 2nd, the defenders were in the middle of the siege and their circumstances were uncertain, to say the least. Today, I'm going to take you to the Alamo, and we're going to use the pen of its commander, William Barrett Travis, to set the scene in Texas 180 years ago. Texas, Travis wrote several letters during the siege, and when you read them, you see how the sense of desperation and, indeed, despair increased as the siege went on. We're going to talk about the folks that were in the Alamo and take a quick look at some of the famous stories that came out of that time. So let's go back 180 years to 1836 and get wise about Texas. It's February 23rd, 1836, and the Texians are in Behar. Travis and Bowie are sharing the command of the garrison. The sentries in Behar spot the Mexican cavalry advancing on the town. The Texian scouts confirmed that the army was near, and Travis ordered everyone into the Alamo, which by this time is thought to be very defensible. It wasn't just soldiers, though, who took refuge in the Alamo. Many of the townspeople of Behar had fled to ranches around the town, but many couldn't flee, or else they were connected to the defenders of the Alamo somehow, and they didn't want to get out of town. Word had gotten to the citizens of Behar that while Santa Ana was dealing with another rebellion in Zacatecas, the Mexican army, under his direction, had been merciless to the citizens. So the Alamo sounded like a pretty good place to be. Two prominent citizens who retreated to the Alamo were daughters of Jose Antonio Navarro. The Navarros were Corsicans and were said to have been related to Napoleon Bonaparte's family. Ironically, Santa Ana called himself the Napoleon of the West. Now, Jose Antonio Navarro and his family actually are said to have become acquainted with with Santa Ana when he was in Bejar as a young lieutenant in the Spanish army. Well, one of the sisters, Juana, was raised in the house of Juan Veramendi, and we know Jim Bowie was married to Veramendi's daughter, Ursula. So Juana and Ursula would have been close. Juana had married a Texian colonist named Horatio Alsbury. Mr. Alsbury at this time had left Bejar to find a place for his family to relocate when Santa Ana arrived in the town. Juana and one of her cousins, Maria Gertrudis Navarro, took refuge in the Alamo on February 23rd. Their father, Jose, was in Washington on the Brazos and was one of the several Tejanos to sign the Declaration of Independence. Another family that took refuge in the Alamo were the Esparzas. Now, Gregorio Esparza, his real name was actually Jose Maria Esparza, was born in Bejar. He had a wife, three sons, and a daughter. They had planned to flee the town, but they couldn't find any wagons. So Gregorio decided to stay and help defend the Alamo. Mrs. Esparza decided the family should stay with Gregorio and take refuge in the Alamo. One of their sons, Enrique, was eight when the Alamo siege was going on, and he recalled that they made several trips with their favorite possessions and settled in the Alamo. Now, an interesting aspect to the Esparza story is that of Gregorio's brother, Francisco. Francisco Esparza fought in the Mexican army during the siege of Bejar. And after Coast surrendered, Francisco and other local Mexican soldiers were allowed to remain in town. Santa Ana had called them into service during the Alamo siege as reserve troops, but Francisco did not actually fight in the later battle. But after the battle was over, Francisco participated in a very unique circumstance. And uh, we're going to do a bonus episode on the battle, and I'll discuss Francisco's situation. Another non-combatant that retreated into the Alamo was the very well-known Susanna Dickinson. She was married to Almiron Dickinson, who had left Susanna and their infant daughter Angelina in Gonzales to go and fight during the siege of Bejar. Susanna and the baby followed him to Bejar, and Susanna ended up running a boarding house, and one of her boarders was actually David Crockett. 
When the Mexican army arrived in town, Almiron Dickinson rode out quickly and put the baby and Susanna on his horse and escaped into the Alamo even as the Mexican army was marching up what is now Commerce Street in San Antonio. Now, several other noncombatants retreated into the Alamo before the siege, although I'm not sure we can ever know for sure exactly how many were there and who they were. Now, as folks took refuge from the advancing Mexicans, Travis wrote a couple of letters. The first was to the citizens of Gonzales. He wrote, quote, The enemy is in large force and in sight. We want men and provisions. Send them to us. We have 150 men and are determined to defend the Alamo to the last. Give us assistance. P.S. Send an express to San Felipe with news night and day. Close quote. Now note in this letter, Travis specifically mentions his desire to defend the Alamo to the last. He wanted the big battle of the Texas Revolution to be in Bejar. The second letter that day was sent under both Travis and Bowie's signatures to James Fannin at Goliath. This is what they wrote. We have removed all the men to the Alamo where we can make such resistance as is due our honor and that of a country until we can get assistance from you, which we expect you to forward immediately. In this extremity, we hope you will send us all the men you can spare promptly. We have 146 men who are determined never to retreat. We have but little provisions, but enough to serve us till you and your men arrive. We deem it unnecessary to repeat to a brave officer who knows his duty that we call on him for assistance. Close quote. Now, a couple of things about this letter. Finn and Bowie are pretty direct and almost confrontational with Fannin, which is curious to me. It's as if uh, Travis and Fannin had argued about whether to defend Behar at all. Now, remember that Houston favored destroying the Alamo and defending Goliad. Bowie had been sent to discuss the matter with the Behar garrison, but changed his opinion on the Alamo and believed that Behar should be defended. The provisional government in Washington on the Brazos decided also that Behar should be defended. The last time he was with the Army, however, Houston had been with Fannin, so no doubt the subject was discussed. Now, another important event occurred in the Alamo the same day these letters were sent. Santa Ana parlayed with the Texians and demanded a surrender at discretion. Travis gave his answer to that demand by firing the biggest cannon in the Alamo, that 18-pounder, right toward Bejar and Santa Ana. Well, Santa Ana got the message, and the fate of the Alamo defenders was sealed. On February 24th, things were moving fairly fast. The Texans woke up to discover that the Mexicans had built some artillery positions overnight, One in particular was built about 400 yards west of the Alamo. They began pounding the Alamo with this artillery steadily. The Texans were answering their shots, but with relatively little effect. Now, the eight-year-old Enrique Esparza that I mentioned earlier recalled that the Texians captured a Mexican soldier on this day and used him to interpret the various bugle calls of the Mexican army during the siege. Another significant event that happened this day was that James Bowie collapsed from illness. Now, we don't know for sure what he had. Some say he had typhoid fever. Some say tuberculosis. Some say pneumonia. I don't think it matters all that much. What matters is that he was out of commission and Travis was left in command of the Alamo garrison. The course by this point was clear, though. There was going to be a fight. Perhaps the most significant event of February 24th was the famous letter Travis wrote on this day. And here it is in its entirety. To the people of Texas and all Americans in the world, February 24th, 1836. Fellow citizens and compatriots, I am besieged by a thousand or more of the Mexicans under Santa Ana. I have sustained a continual bombardment and cannonade for 24 hours and have not lost a man. The enemy has demanded a surrender at discretion. Otherwise, the garrison are to be put to the sword if the fort is taken. I have answered the demand with a cannon shot, and our flag still waves proudly from the walls. I shall never surrender or retreat. Then I call on you in the name of liberty, of patriotism, and everything dear to the American character to come to our aid with all dispatch. The enemy is receiving reinforcements daily and will no doubt increase to three or four thousand in four or five days. If this call is neglected, 
I am determined to sustain myself as long as possible and die like a soldier who never forgets what is due to his own honor and that of his country. Victory or death. William Barrett Travis, Lieutenant Colonel, Commandant. P.S. The Lord is on our side. When the enemy appeared in sight, we had not three bushels of corn. We have since found in deserted houses 80 or 90 bushels and got into the walls 20 or 30 head of beeves. Travis. Folks, that is one of the most stirring and important letters in history. You can feel Travis's determination in every word. He also gives his fellow Texians more information about how the defenders improved their food supply, implying that there was still time to come to their aid. He was arguing that they had a real chance to endure a long siege. Now, February 25th brought some action. A Mexican force under General Castrion attacked and got very close to the Alamo walls. The Texans beat them back and at the same time burned some huts, which were called jacalas. I hope that pronunciation is right. They were very close to the Alamo. Now, these straw huts were providing cover for the Mexicans, and the Texans burned them to take that advantage away. Travis wrote another letter on the 25th, this one to Sam Houston. Now, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's pretty long, but it's a report of the events that occurred from the 23rd to the 25th. He informs Houston of the fighting that had occurred earlier that day. He describes it as a great victory, no doubt encouraging their commander-in-chief to send help. He specifically mentions David Crockett. He said, quote, the Honorable David Crockett was seen at all points, animating the men to do their duty, close quote. Travis then implores Houston to send help, and he ends the letter with this plea, quote, give me help, O my country, victory or death, close quote. That night, a cold front blew in, and it dropped the temperatures in the Alamo to almost freezing. Now let's jump forward a couple of days to February the 26th. Both sides continue to work on their emplacements. The Mexicans dug some trenches on the south side of the Alamo, and as they did so, the Texans were firing on the workers steadily. The most significant event this day was that the Mexicans cut off the water to the Alamo. There's a small canal that runs to the east of the Alamo. It's still there, by the way. And the Mexicans cut off the water flow from the main part of the river, so that essentially cut off the water supply to the entire fort. On that Sunday... The Mexicans heard that Fannin was coming to help the Alamo and bringing hundreds of men. Now, of course, that wasn't the case, but Santa Ana sent a force toward Goliad anyway to accept, in, intercept excuse me, any, any reinforcements coming that way. About this time, Santa Ana also declared a three-day armistice to allow the Texans a chance to think about surrendering. Now, there are various first-hand accounts about this period indicating that several people did in fact leave during this time. Now, on March 1st, 32 men arrived from Gonzales to reinforce the garrison. These men, who we now call the Gonzales Rangers, would be the last reinforcements to enter the Alamo. On March the 2nd, 180 years ago, today, Travis sent a detachment of men to Juan Seguin's ranch to gather some corn that they had heard he had to further provision the garrison. Now, This is the day, as we talked about earlier, that the Convention on Washington on the Brazos declared independence from Mexico. The Alamo defenders, of course, didn't know this, but it was important to Travis, and we'll see that in a later letter. Thursday, March the 3rd, brought some hopeful news. James Butler Bonham had arrived in camp reporting that an additional 60 men were coming from Gonzales and 600 more men would be en route to help the Alamo. The Texans, of course, were overjoyed and celebrated. The Mexicans were also celebrating, though. Remember the Matamoros expedition? In the last episode, I discussed how Sam Houston had ridden amongst the men on their way to Matamoros, telling them that the expedition was not a good idea, but I didn't tell you why. Well, here's why. Recall that Houston wanted to defend Goliad, and he had tried to plant the seeds of doubt amongst the men of the Matamoros expedition that the expedition was not a good idea and they should return, and he managed to convince many of them to turn back to Goliad or Gonzales. The remainder, under Dr. James Grant, now remember, Grant had simply declared himself the commander, and we discussed that in the last episode. They continued on to San Patricio. And after a couple of different engagements with General Urea's force, and I'll do an episode on that with some more detail later, the Texans were defeated. A legend has it that Urea sent word to the citizens of San Patricio to leave a light burning in their houses so the Mexicans wouldn't attack them because Grant's men had been staying in the houses in town. It so happens that 
uh, a co-commander, Francis Johnson, was up late working and had a light on, so the Mexicans didn't find him or some of his men. He eventually made it back to Goliad, but many of his men were killed. The Mexicans in Bejar were peeling the church bells to celebrate this Texian defeat. And Santa Ana also got his final reinforcements on March the 3rd. Travis wrote a letter to the convention at Washington on the Brazos on March the 3rd. In that letter, Travis described how the Mexicans had built artillery batteries all, all around the Alamo and built other fortifications in the town. He also talks of the Gonzales reinforcements and the strong fortifications of the Alamo at one point calling the walls cannonproof. Travis discusses the fact that he fears Fannin won't come help him, which of course was the case. We know this not only because he didn't come help him, but also because Fannin had written a letter on February 28th to acting Texas Governor James Robinson, and he was explaining his opinion that Behar and Goliad were both important. Urea was headed for Goliad, and so at the present time, it was important to stay in Goliad and defend it. He also noted that his supplies were too low to march toward Behar. Well, back in Travis's letter, he also says something interesting. He tells the government that if supplies and reinforcements are sent, that, quote, this neighborhood, meaning Behar, will be the great and decisive battleground. The power of Santa Ana is to be met here or in the colonies. We had better meet them here than suffer a war of desolation to rage our settlements, close quote. It's interesting because Travis is clearly seeking to have a huge battle in San Antonio. He goes on to point out that Santa Ana is waving the red banner from the San Fernando Church and they'll all be killed if the Alamo falls. He also points out that the Behar citizens have abandoned the Alamo and should be declared public enemies. He ends his letter, God in Texas, victory or death. Now the tone of that letter is decidedly more worried than the tone of the February 24th letter, which was more rousing and hopeful. Also on March 3rd, Travis wrote to two of his friends, Jesse Grimes and David Ayers. In his letter to Grimes, Travis is a little more realistic about his prospects. First, he encourages Grimes to push for independence. He clearly intends for Texas to declare independence and for that to rally the troops. He even says that his men will surrender if independence isn't declared. Now, this is a day after independence was declared, but Travis didn't know that at the time. But he's also somewhat grim toward his prospects of reinforcements. He tells Grimes, quote, If my countrymen do not rally to my relief, I am determined to perish in the defense of this place, and my bones shall reproach my country for her neglect. Close quote. On the same day, he wrote to David Ayers. This is what he wrote, quote, Take care of my little boy. If the country should be saved, I may make for him a splendid fortune. But if the country be lost and I should perish... He will have nothing but the proud recollection that he's the son of a man who died for his country. Close quote. So you can see in these letters that Travis knew his chances were slim, and he no doubt could see Santa Ana making preparations for the attack. By the next day, March the 5th, the Mexican artillery had moved to within 200 yards of the Alamo. Now on this day, the famous line in the sand story is said to have occurred. The story goes that Travis assembled his men in the courtyard of the Alamo and gave them a realistic but inspirational speech. He offered that any man who wanted to leave the compound could go. He supposedly drew a line in the sand with his sword and invited any man who was brave enough to fight and die for Texas to cross that line. It said that every man did except one. Bowie was even confined to his bed by this time, and, and it said that he had men carry his bed across the line. Now, there's a lot of controversy surrounding this story because it didn't really appear until 1873, and then it was double hearsay. Now, we're serious about Texas history at Wise About Texas, and we'll do a thorough and critical examination of that story and others some other time. But for this episode, 180 years after the Alamo's fall, let's just say that Travis could have drawn the line in the sand, and he should have drawn the line in the sand. And whether he actually did... Those defenders stayed in the Alamo because they wanted independence. They wanted the self-government that had been promised to them, and they wanted to free Texas from a tyrannical dictator. And that's good enough for me. In just a few short hours, they would fight the final and decisive battle of the Alamo. Well, now we come to the segment of the show I call Getting There where I tell you how to go see some of the places mentioned in the episode. Now, this episode centered around the Alamo, so we don't have to go very far. And I'll tell you 
a couple of important spots during the siege. First of all, on March the 6th, there's an annual celebration at the Alamo called Dusk at the Alamo, and uh, where they commemorate the lighting of the funeral pyres, and that's certainly something you should check out. Um, so we'll talk about a couple of spots around the Alamo. First, on February 24th, remember I mentioned that the Mexican artillery was set up about 400 yards from the fort across the river. Now that battery, as near as I can tell from reading descriptions of where it was, I'm guessing it was on Commerce, about on Commerce Street between North Presa and Navarro. Uh, there is a Shipley's Donuts there now, so grab a donut and picture firing a cannon at the Alamo. Another artillery position was south of the Alamo, probably somewhere across Commerce from the River Center Mall, maybe about the Chamber of Commerce building. There was another artillery position northeast of the Alamo, about where the Masonic Lodge is today on 4th Street. Now, these are estimates based on my limited map skills, but close enough for government work. The famous February 24th letter from Travis is in the state archives in Austin, and occasionally they display it. Uh, The last time it was displayed, I, I took a picture of it in the case, so I'll put that up on the website. On San Antonio's main plaza is San Fernando Church, where you can visit. The remains of the Alamo's defenders are there, and you can see that. That wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas. I really appreciate all the great feedback we're getting for this show. I'm on my way to the Texas State Historical Association meeting this weekend in Dallas, and I'm sure I'll have more great ideas for future episodes. In the meantime, please leave a review on iTunes if you get a chance, and like and share the Wise About Texas Facebook page. We're also on Twitter, at WiseAboutTexas. And we're now on Instagram, where I'm trying to post photos that I put on the website in connection with each episode. So thanks for listening. God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.